Hello and welcome to my little channel. My name is Thomas Alexander and today I want to try out something new, a new format. And what I want to do is um, show you something that is not really related directly to what I've done before, before we've looked at the origins of Islam. And in a sense, we're going to do that today as well, but um, with a little twist. Um, so what I've prepared today is I want to take you on a trip into the Middle East in the year 1289. And I want to use this as a frame to um, also answer some questions that came up in my earlier videos and to go into the religions of the times of the 13th century, but also of the years before um, when Islam originated, so of, of the 6th and 7th centuries. And to do that, we're going to follow a certain Dominican friar. His name was Ricardo da Monte di Croque, and he was sent on a mission into the Middle East by the Pope. And from his travels, he returned with a, um, a report. And this, that's what we're going to go through today. So let me show you. I'm gonna I'm gonna probably look all over the place because my control screen is over here, uh, here. <laughs> yeah, but we'll we'll get we'll get by. Anyway, so it's called the Book of Pilgrimage, but as we'll see in a moment, it's not just about pilgrimage. He does actually have something to do with that. So let's start here with the prologue. Here begins the book of pilgrimage of Brother Ricordo of the Order of Preachers. Now, the Order of Preachers, those are the Dominicans. Contained briefly in this book are the kingdoms, peoples, provinces, laws, rites, sects, heresies and monsters which I came upon in the eastern regions. My reasons for writing is so that the friars who wish to take on the task of spreading the faith for Christ will know what they need to as well as where and how they can achieve most. I'm guessing it's supposed to mean um, they know they will know what they need to do but anyway um, that's what this is uh, about now let's move on a little bit in obedience therefore to the Lord Pope through the master of my order I began my pilgrimage I crossed the sea in order to see with my bodily eyes those places which Christ had visited in the flesh so we can see here he goes there for two reasons. So I mean, the main reason is that the Pope sends him on a mission, but he also wants to go on a pilgrimage and see the holy sites. And I did prepare a map where we can have a look. So this is a map of the time when Ricoldo went on his on his uh, journey. And this is yeah roughly uh, 1290 AD, and because I'm a nerd, I made it in Latin. Um, probably not perfect, but this should give us a good idea of how the known world looked like. So he typically, oh, well, typically he did travel by boat, Ricardo that is, and well, probably looked something like this. So we don't obviously know exactly his route, where they stopped and so on. Um, I'm guessing they stopped in Cyprus because that's a major crusader stronghold at the time. And then from there they went into Akko, which was the capital of the um, Kingdom of Jerusalem at the time, because Jerusalem was no longer in Christian hands. So let us zoom in a little bit. Okay. So. This is... Um, Akko is where our friar arrived. And then from there, he, he did go and see some holy places. So that part, <clears throat> I'm going to try and keep it as short as possible because we want to go into the, 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 the mission that he's on in a bit more detail. So he went to the Sea of Galilee, got back to Akko. From there, along the coast, I went down and into Jerusalem. Now here, I want to um, go, go to the next little bit.
From there we descended Mount Zion and came to the house of the friar preachers. Um, uh, the friars preacher. So those would be other Dominicans. So the house of the friars preacher would be a convent in located in Jerusalem. And um, this is interesting because <clears throat> otherwise we wouldn't know if, if um, Ricoldo hadn't written this, we wouldn't have known that there was actually a Dominican convent in Jerusalem at the time. Um, this place, so this convent, is between the Temple of Solomon and the Temple of the Lord, which sounds strange at first because in those times temp the Temple of Solomon referred to what is nowadays known as the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Temple of the Lord was typically um, used to refer to the Dome of the Rock. But between there, there really is no place for a house um, of the friars preacher. So that's why I guess the um, translator put in here the Holy Sepulchre in um, brackets. So presumably he refers to the Holy Sepulchre with the Temple of the Lord. Though later on he does um, talk about the Holy Sepulchre and he's, um, well, <laughs> the, w the way he talks about it, he's really taken, taken in by it and he's um, in enthusiastic to, to visit it. Um, and he does refer to it as the Holy Sepulchre and not as the Temple of the Lord, at least in this translation. So maybe that's also a quirk of the translation that later on they replaced Temple of the Lord with, with Holy Sepulchre. I haven't looked at the Latin original, um, which I probably should have done before, <laughs> before recording this. Um, anyway, we do have, however, a French manuscript from this, um, from his travels which is actually um, packed in together with a uh, with the story of Marco Polo um, but I'm using some images from there so that was written in the late 15th century so roughly a hundred years after the book was written and here we can get, get a nice idea of how the artists um, in Europe back then imagined these travels um, what these travels would have looked like so here we see our two Dominican friars, as you can easily tell by the the white clothing underneath the black robes. Um, that's the look of the Dominicans. And they are kneeling in front of the Pope who sends them on their mission. Now let's get back to our map. And uh, let's get rid of those. So he, Ricardo, does talk a lot about um, Jerusalem, and he visits Bethlehem from there. But as I said, I'm not. I don't really want to um, focus on his pilgrimage so much as um, on his mission, which then starts after he went to the holy sites. So from Jerusalem, he goes back up to Akko, and then from Akko, he boards a ship, and sails north into Lesser Armenia and that is because the Pope sent him to actually um, preach to the other Christians of the Orient, the Nestorians and the Jacobites, in order to get them back into the Catholic fold. So that was his main mission. He also was supposed to preach to the Saracens, so the, the, the Muslims. Um, yeah, and to do that he traveled through the Middle East. And now at this point, we want to pick up our story again. So we're gonna we're gonna go past all his uh, pilgrimage and him visiting um, the holy places. And now we're in uh, Lesser Armenia. And here he writes. From there we went thirty miles to Mamistra, which is um, Mopsuesita where the greatest heretic Bishop Theodore used to live, who, corrupting the entire gospel with his interpretation, said that the Virgin was not a God-bearer, but bore a regular man and a templum dei, so that's a temple for God. We found his poisonous book among the Nestorians throughout the East, for Nestorius was his, so Theodore's, disciple. Theodore was the teacher of Nestorius. Um, and a lot of a lot of um, Nestorius's teachings are derived from Theodore. And here, oh, let's 
Get back here. So I'm gonna go to a slide that I have shown before in one of my presentations where we can see the different types of Christianity and how they um, are interrelated. So what we can see here is that we have the Monophysites and the Nestorians, and those are the ones um, whom Ricardo wants to talk about, uh, to talk to, because they are still around in the year um, or in the year 1290, unlike the Arians or the, these um, Syrian anti-Trinitarians, unless we count Islam, of course. So that's still around, obviously. Yeah, um, we'll get we'll get more into this uh, at a later point. Um, but for now, let's go back to let's get back to our map. Uh, zoom in again. Yeah, so we're now in Lesser Armenia, and Ricardo moves on and he goes north towards Sebastia, and that's where he meets the Turks for the first time. And this is what he has to say about them. Crossing Lesser Armenia, we entered Turkey and came upon the Turkmens, a nearly bestial people, who are Saracens and ordinarily live under the earth like moles. Um, which is an, interest, an interesting observation, probably not true. Um, but I've included this also because there's a nice depiction here in uh, this French manuscript I talked about. So here we can see our two uh, Dominican friars and in the back they are the Turks living like moles, at least that's how the artist imagines it, a um, hundred years after this text is written. They emerge from their burrows like mice and immediately fall into regiment. They are a strong and ferocious people, especially the women. Of this I will recount but one story and remain silent about the rest. As we were going with the camels, a pregnant Turkmen woman was following on foot, and when we were in the desert that night, she gave birth in silence. The next morning, we were astonished to discover a crying little infant being carried by the mother who was following the camels on foot as she had before. So that's also something we can see on, our, on this picture. So there is uh, the mother with the child and the camels in the back. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, fi I, fi I find this... Uh, Quite, quite interesting. But now, uh, more importantly, he also, um, wait, let me bring the map back up. On his way, he also meets the Mongols for the first time, who of, who of course control much of the East um, in the 13th century. No, he writes, leaving Turkey, we came upon the horrible and monstrous tribe of the Tatars. The Tatars differ greatly from all other nations of the world in appearance, customs and right. In appearance, they have very large, broad faces and small eyes, narrow slits crossing the middle of the face and beards so small that many of them very much resemble apes, especially the old men. In customs, they are unlike everyone else because they do not have any manners modesty, gratitude, or attachment to a particular place as to other nations. Rather, they seem to hate every city and every building of residence, for they have destroyed almost every city, town, house, and building. And indeed, that's what uh, the Mongols did. So when they took cities, um, most of the time they would just destroy everything and kill everyone. Um, maybe take some slaves, but by and large, people were just dead. Um, houses burned, libraries burned, so it wasn't wasn't nice to be a victim of a Mongol attack. Um, here, I also want to show quickly a, a another picture. And this is not in, um, related to um, the story of uh, Ricoldo, but of Marco Polo. But it's from the same document and from the same manuscript. And here we see how the artist imagined. Um, the great Khan to look like who's sitting there on his throne and who is uh, giving presents to the Polo family. Um, anyway, Ricoldo continues about them. The Tatars believe in and wait for a foolish resurrection, which is the same as this life, and therefore in death they provide for each one according to his means. The poor cook meat in abundance and buried with the dead man, surrounding him on every side with cooked meat and new clothes, in addition to the clothes worn by the dead man. They also give him some money. The rich add a change of clothing um, to the meat and money. Great barons, 
add to all this a good horse. When they prepare the dead man for burial, his squire mounts his horse and runs it to exhaustion. Afterwards, he washes the horse's head with pure strong wine. Then the horse is killed and, the, and he disembowels it and fills its stomach with green grass. And after that, he thrusts a large stake through the rear end and out of its mouth. He leaves the impaled horse suspended thus and commands it to be ready for whenever the Lord wishes to arise. Then they bury the dead man in his tomb. When an emperor dies, they add all kinds of precious stones and also great treasures to all of the above. And their custom is to bury up, uh, to bury up to twenty slaves and servants alive with the dead lord, so they will be ready to serve their lord when he wishes to arise. Now, obviously, the Christians didn't like this at all and were uh, horrified by this custom. Um, but there's also another interesting piece here. You must know that the Tatars honor the Baxitas above all other men in the world. A kind of idle priest, these Indian men are very wise and exceedingly well ordered and dignified in behavior. They are unusually familiar with the magical arts. They rely on the counsel and aid of demons and perform many tricks and predict the future. One of the greatest among them was said to fly, but it was discovered that he in fact did not fly, but walked close to the earth without touching it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting way of phrasing it. And when he appeared to be sitting, nothing solid was holding him up. Some of them say that there are 365 gods. Others say that the gods number 100 tomans. One toman is equal to 10,000. So that would be a million. But all agree that there is one, only one principal god. They say that they are the brothers of the Christians and that they are of the same right and belief as we are. But they do not know Christ. They say that the flood of Noah was not in their province and that the world has endured for more than 30,000 years. For they say that new idols are always marked in stone after 1,000 years and after 10,000. These men are black and sunburned, but their country is very temperate. So this sounds like um, he is talking about um, uh, Hindus. So maybe there were Hindus among the Tatars wh whom he met, or maybe you heard about them. But this must be one of the earliest accounts of Hindus uh, in the West. Going on. The Tatars say they are the people of God, and because of this they claim that many miracles are connected to their arrival and victories. They say that God called them from the mountains and into deserted places. But they are not the people of God as they believe, any more than Alexander and his army were the special people of God for having closed off the Caspian mountains through a miracle, as is read in Historia Scholastica. Now here, again, we have an interesting piece. Um, maybe you've seen my recent video on the Alexander legend in the Quran, the story of Dul Karnain, wherein uh, in this um, Syriac legend, Alexander builds a um, wall of iron and brass in the Caspian mountains in order to hold back uh, the evil forces of Gog and Magog. And it is said that at the end of times, they would breach through the wall and re um, ravage the lands. Now here we have a similar and probably related story uh, in the Historia Scholastica. But there, Alexander at first tries to build a wall of stone and mortar, which wasn't good enough. So he prays to God, and then God actually moves the mountains and closes um, cl and closes the, the pass, thereby sealing off um, the, um, the evil people beyond the Caspian mountains. But again, it also says that at the end of days, uh, they would still come over and ravage the land. So here we can see a continuation of this legend in a different form. But it gets uh, better. So here he writes, Alexander miraculously closed the mountains so that there would be no way they could escape. Moreover, Josephus and Methodius said that they will come forth at the end of the world and commit a great massacre of humans. So again, um, here we have now the projection of this apocalyptic belief of earlier centuries onto the Mongols. So when Methodius wrote, wrote, or not Methodius, actually it's Pseudo-Methodius, so it was also written in the late 7th century probably, this, this text. Um, he also works off of this Syriac Alexander legend 
for his apocalypse. But back then, they thought that it was the Khazars who had breached through um, the Caspian Mountains and into Persia and ravaged the lands. So they projected this apocalyptic belief on those Khazars. Now, um, 500 years later, people start to map this belief onto the Mongols. And it actually gets even more um, literal. They say that they are descendant from Gog and Magog. So those were the ones that Alexander kept behind um, the iron and brass uh, wall in, in the Aramaic Alexander legend and in the Quran. Um, they say that they are descended from Gog and Magog, from which they call themselves Mongols, which is a corrupted form of Magogli. Uh, Methodius also said that Alexander imprisoned Gog and Magog, a very polluted nation, and many others along with the sons of the captive Jews. He also says that they will emerge at the end of time and will commit a great massacre of humans. So here again we have this we have um, echoes of this Syriac Alexander legend in um, the report of Ricoldo. And uh, that also tells us how prevalent it was, that it was still around um, yeah, more than 500 years later, even though the apocalypse didn't come back then, but now people start to um, yeah, map it onto the Mongols. Um, and he goes on and talks about uh, the Tatars, where they come from, what they did. Um, there's one thing I want to again focus on, this a little bit uh, now I have a history lesson, um, but it's interesting nonetheless. So then the Tatars divided into three squadrons. That is um, already a little bit off. Um, technically it was four. So shortly before um, Ricardo went on his, on his trip, the Mongol Empire actually did fall apart into four parts, not three. But uh, Ricardo tells us something about them. So, the squadron, the squadron with the Great Khan occupied the expansive province of Kathai, that is uh, China, all the way um, to far off India. They killed Prester John and seized his empire, and the son of the Great Khan took Tachaskutun, the daughter of Prester John, as his wife. And they destroyed and exterminated 12 great kingdoms in this region. Um, so yeah, let's let's go through this backwards. So from uh, start, let's start at the back. And they destroyed and exterminated twelve great kingdoms in this region. Obviously, the number twelve is a very important and, and uh, number, so that's why we find it here. Um, and then we have this part about Prester John, and that is important um, in so far as we see here the merging of, of his account with another legendary story that was around uh, the time of um, Ricoldo, um, particularly maybe a hundred years earlier or even more than that. Um, around the time of, of uh, the First Crusade there was this belief in Europe that in the Far East, in India, there is this great uh, Prester John who was Christian and who would come uh, to the aid of the Crusaders from the East attacking the Saracens. And there was a fake letter uh, making the rounds in Europe. Somebody uh, obviously forged it coming to your um, coming to uh, to the European courts as um, supposedly as a as the as being sent by Prester John and in this letter there were all kinds of wonders described about his kingdom and his power and his might. So much so that the Pope tried to find Prester John and he sent um, missions into the East um, to talk and negotiate with Prester John. Obviously, they didn't find him. Um, and in some legends, um, when the Mongols first arrived on the scene, uh, the Europeans thought that those were uh, the troops of Prester John. Um, I mean, it quickly became obvious that they weren't because they just killed everyone. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so here we can see remnants of this belief in this Prester John. But since he obviously couldn't be found, um, now the belief was that the Mongols killed him as well and destroyed his kingdom. And of course, um, the the Great Khan occupied the expensive province of, of 
Cathay, so China. That would be the Yuan Dynasty, um, which is not my map because it doesn't go far enough to the east. Um, here in the east we have the uh, um, Changatai um, Khanate. That's the one um, which the culture apparently isn't aware of. Um, that's the fourth um, part of the um, yeah of the f the fourth Khanate that um, came out of the original uh, Mongol Empire. <clears throat> anyway, um, back to our text by Ricoldo. The second squadron crossed the Iron Gate, went around the Black Sea and depopulated all of Ga Gazaria of its Blakons, um, Russians, Albanians and Ruthenians. They also destroyed Hungary and Poland, seizing and destroying 12 great kingdoms from the Black Sea to Kumania. Again, we have the number 12 in here. What is interesting also is um, the Iron Gate. So the Iron Gate, um, let me put it on the map, that was is somewhere around here. Um, this was a strategically important pass through the Caspian Mountains. And back in the days, the Persians actually had built a great wall um, to protect themselves from the nomadic peoples of the north. And it actually worked um, for the most part. In, uh, um, but at the end of the war with the Byzantines, with Heraclius, um, Heraclius allied himself with the Khazars in the north, and they actually breached through this, the gate in the wall, um, through the Iron Gate, and ravaged the lands. So that was what inspired this um, myth in the Alexander legend that we've talked about. And the fact that this pass was called the Iron Gate may be the reason, um, or plausibly was the reason, that in the Alexander legend we hear about Ale uh, Alexander building a wall of iron and brass. Um, an iron wall for the Iron Gate kind of makes kind of makes sense as a as a metaphor, as a well, yeah, image. Okay. Um, of course, the. Uh, the Mongols didn't cross the Iron Gate, at least not uh, in order, at least not here, the Golden Horde, which is um, what he's talking about. Um, so this second squadron is talking about, yeah, here the Golden Horde controlled all of the north of Asia into Russia. So here we have all the Russian provinces. Um, well, they were all under the control of the Golden Horde. Um, further west here we have Hungary and Poland. They were also um, so it's true they were also um, destroyed by the Mongols. The Mongols then retreated from there um, because the Great Khan died and they never ca um, came back, at least not to conquer. They did come back to raid. Um, and But yeah, uh, they didn't expand their dominion any further than Russia. And then he, let's get on to the third squadron. They crossed uh, the Gion and Phison, the river of paradise, and destroyed Khorasan. Um, Khorasan, that is of course in northeastern Persia, uh, somewhere, somewhere around here. And yeah, so here he's talking about the Ilkhanate, so that's um, well, another one of these um, Mongol em um, successor empires, and they really they they totally destroyed um, Khorasan. This was maybe the cultural and intellectual center of the Persian Empire, the late Persian Empire, and also the Caliphate. Um, after the Mongol attack, um, all the major cities were completely destroyed. Their inhabitants all killed. Um, Apparently, they piled up um, heads of of the dead um, in front in front of the burned down city. So, um, probably wasn't a nice sight. And Khorasan never again got to the this importance where it was before the Mongol invasion. Um, yeah. So, continuing, um, they destroyed the Khorasan, the land of the Medes and the Persians, and Baghdad, the capital of the Saracens, where they killed the Caliph. They, they also seized Turkey, the, so Turkey, right, so then they moved on into Turkey, which, yeah, fair enough, that's true, they, they got all the way to the Byzantine Empire, basically, um, destroying the Sultanate of Fum, which was the Turkish, uh, the, the um, Seljuk 
Turks um, who controlled Anatolia at that time, they fell under under Mongol rule. Um, they killed all the Kolosmias and seized and emptied Syria all the way to Gaza. Um, they took Jerusalem and gave it to the Christians. That's obviously not true, so here his information is wrong. And they occupied the whole country from the Indian Ocean to the Black Sea and from the Black Sea to the, to the Mediterranean Sea to Gaza. There the, there the desert prevented them from crossing into Egypt. So again, that last part, not true. Um, they never went down in Syria. Um, well, maybe for, for raids or such, but they didn't conquer Jerusalem and give it to the Christians, obviously. He's probably referring to the fact that the Nestorians actually did quite well under uh, under the Mongols, um, in as much as they weren't killed during during their con <laughs> during them during the during the conquering. Um, but afterwards the Mongols were actually quite religiously tolerant. They didn't really care about religion that much. So um, the Nestorians are probably freer in their uh, religious life than they were before under under the Caliphate. Uh, so maybe that's what he's referring to uh, here in this passage. But yeah, certainly they didn't have any position to like to be gifted cities or such, uh, let alone Jerusalem. Okay. Um, it tells us some more about uh, the history of the Tatars, um, but at this point we're going to now move on. So he writes, from there we came down, uh, we came to Tabris, which is the capital of Persia. So we called he moved somewhere along uh, this path into Tabris. And indeed, Tabris was uh, the capital of Persia at the time, after the Mongols um, in, um, destroyed the caliphate they moved the capital to Tepris and used that um, yeah well at least in the Ilkhanate so in this in this part of, of the Mongol Empire that was their capital we stayed in Tepris for a half a year and preached to them in the Arabic language through a translator so um, at this point Ecoldo wasn't yet fluent in Arabic obviously um, he, later on he was, so he did study Arabic so that he could um, preach in Arabic and talk to the locals in their native language. He was in general a very um, educated man, obviously he spoke Latin, he spoke Greek, he also spoke um, Syriac, Aramaic, so that he could talk with the uh, Nestorians and, uh, and the Jacobites. Um, but apparently his preaching wasn't too successful because it doesn't talk about any conversions there. It just um, says that he stayed there for half a year, which is quite a long time. Um, in other places, he's only too happy to tell us about all the conversions that he um, that came about because of him. Here he doesn't talk about it, so presumably his preachings weren't very successful. Um, from there, he moves south into Mosul. Um, he meets the Kurds, whom he didn't like apparently too much. But then he gets to Nineveh, or rather to Mosul, because Nineveh is also destroyed. Um, and the new city that was built is Mosul. And there he meets the Jacobites. Um, and here, again, I have a picture from the, ma from the French manuscript. There we are. Um, there it is. So this is how our 15th century artist imagined the Jacobites look like. And you can see um, one of them wearing a dunce's cap. Uh, so he didn't think too highly of the Jacobites. Um, no, this is what Ricardo writes about them. Near the same city, so that's Mosul, um, beyond the river of paradise is the very renowned and very famous monastery of St. Matthew, where the seat of the Jacobite Patriarch is located. They say 300 monks are there. We went there and found men of great abstinence and great prayer. For every day, in addition to another general office, which is very long, they pray the entire Psalter while standing. But they're heretics. They say that there is in Christ one substance, one nature, one will, and one operation, namely the divine only. Now here, the Jacobites would probably object to uh, Ricardo's um, phrasing. 
It is true that they believe that in Christ there's only one substance, one nature, one will, and one operation. But they would argue it's both divine and human, so that that the two na um, the two natures they make up uh, Christ are really so um, intertwined, if you will, that they become one. Um, and that's also the sort of the difference between miaphysites and monophysites, um, which is just a linguistic difference. So it both refers to the same people, um, but the the monophysite term, which is actually the more prevalent one and the one that I also mostly use, um, comes from this perspective of, of Ricardo, which says um, that um, yeah, there's only one one will and one nature, and it's the divine one, whereas the Miaphysites, um, the term which um, the Jacobites would probably prefer, um, emphasizes more that there's this combination. It's still only one will and one nature, but not um, divine only. So here we really have more of a semantic argument than a theological argument going on. Um, but well, I mean, there's there's more um, to the differences, but but that's that's the main one. So the nature of, of Jesus Christ, to Christology, um, what does it really mean? And um, there are debates. And here, Ricardo um, claims to have converted many many of the monks in the monastery, um, in, including. Uh, including the patriarch, but obviously that um, didn't last. So he only converted individuals. He didn't um, set up an operation to, to keep this going and to unify the, these Nestorians with the Catholic Church. Uh, maybe it's just assumed that um, his job was done and would go on, but uh, um, there was no long-term effect here. Um, but then he moves on. Now let me, let me get the map back. So now he moves further south, um, and somewhere along the way, he meets uh, the Maronites. And he, he says, midway into our journey, so that's the journey from Mosul to Baghdad, we came upon a great city where there are many Maronites, and the Archbishop of the Maronites. The Maronites are heretics from Mount Lebanon, who say that there is only one will in Christ. Um, so here he is referring to mono, um, monothelitism. That was actually Heraclius's attempt at finding a compromise formula which both the Catholics and the monophysites could agree upon. So he basically put forth this compromise formula that um, Jesus had two natures and uh, there were two natures in Jesus, but only one will. Um, at the end of the day, neither side liked it. Um, both the monophysites and the Catholics rejected it. So it was it was a failed attempt. Um, but apparently, there were still some people around who now follow this third um, Christology, if you will. So instead of uniting Christianity, it, it split it further. Um, though it never really gained much traction, to be honest. And here we are also not sure if Ricardo is correct. I mean, there really is uh, not so much of a reason to, to doubt him because it doesn't. He doesn't. It that wouldn't make sense really to uh, deliberately deliberately lie here, um, unless he never met them. That's a possibility, and he just made up this story. Uh, we, un, un, other than this document, we have never heard of the Maronites being um, mono, monothelite, um, monothelites. If they, I mean, it's possible that they were, or at least some group of them were, and in that case, um, Ricardo may have had lasting effect here, unlike with the uh, Jacobites, um, because uh, afterwards they certainly were in communion with the Catholic Church uh, until this day. Um, question is, were they ever out of it? Um, anyway, he goes on to, to write, but the Archbishop listened to our profession of faith in Arabic and he wrote to the Pope in his own hand about the faith as we wished on the subject of obedience to the Pope and to the Holy Roman Church. So yeah, so the Maronites, they are in communion with the Holy Roman Church. Um, 
and question is were they ever out um we don't know but according to recall they were now he moves on and then we hear about him meeting the shia for the first time so we came upon another great city along the river the ancient baghdad or babylon so that's just him guessing so he found this ancient city he thought might be old baghdad or old babylon uh, in reality it was samara its great ruins made it seem almost like another Rome, almost totally destroyed. It had very few inhabitants. They were the Saracen part partisans of Ali, and partisan, of course, is the direct translation of Shia. Um, yeah, so wait, where's Samara in the map? That would be somewhere here, right? So he now moved down here into Samara. We learned that in actuality the inhabitants of this city were waiting for the son of Ali who had died over 600 years ago and they maintain a noble mule for him so they can receive him honorably. The high priests present the mule saddled and ornamented to the people every Friday when they gather to, um, to hear their law preached. They say that this aforementioned son of Ali will most certainly return to them and on that same day they say that Christ will appear and become a Saracen. Okay, so that's um, that's how he describes the Shia. And then from there he moves on into Baghdad. Okay, and Baghdad, of course, wasn't just the most important city um, in terms of um, Muslim scholarship. Although after the um, Mongol invasion, its importance did, of course, decline, but it was still um, still probably the number one city in all of the Muslim world at that time. <clears throat> but not only that, it was also the city of the Nestorians. And there we have another picture here. So these were the Jacobites in our book. And the Nestorians um, are here, um, at least in the imagination of the artist. And again, you can see the dunce's cap worn, worn by their bishop. Anyway, um, moving on in Ricoldo's report, the Nestorians are heretics who follow Nestorius and Theodore, and they are in many things, especially in regards to Christ. So we've briefly talked about this before, um, following the stories in Theodore. Theodore was actually more important um, to the Nestorian Church, so um, Theodorian Church would probably make more sense. I mean, officially it is called the Church of the East, right? Um, so, but so the Nestorian Church is just a, a nickname, maybe not not the best one. For they say that he has only one nature, so that's Christ, and that he was born of the Virgin Mary just as, as just a man, and that only afterwards did he obtain divine sonship through baptism and the holy works he performed. And you can see here how close this is to this Syrian anti-Trinitarian beliefs that we talked about in my presentation on them. Um, let me bring this up real quick. So here, maybe you remember the slide um, from my previous presentation where we looked at the beliefs of Paul of Samosata, who rejected a physical interpretation of the title Son of God, um, who said that the Logos inhabited Jesus like a temple, pretty much exactly like uh, Theodore said. Um, and that he became the Messiah, not through um, his birth as the Son of God, but because of his works, because he lived his life um, in a way that was pleasing to God. He proved himself to God, and that made it possible for the Holy Spirit to enter him. So that's the Syrian anti-Unitarian pre-Nicene Christian belief. Um, obviously, in the Church of the East that had evolved a little, but so far it, it sounds fairly similar. Therefore, as I know, continuing in the text, therefore they say that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, not by nature, but by adoption. Um, and does that make them adoptionist? Technically, yes. Um, but practically, when we talk about adoptionism in 
Christianity, we mean something differently. So this is, I mean, I can, I'm, one can see where Ricardo is coming from. We probably wouldn't use it to describe the historians, though. Um, it, it, it's a mixed bag, which is also why I personally don't like this term adoptionism, because there are too many, um, it's too familiar a word and comes with preconceived notions. Um, which is why I prefer to, to use others. Anyway, moving on. Uh, and they say that God is in this man just as in their temple. Uh, again, this is uh, the Templum Dei, which we've heard about before by Ricardo when talking about Theodore, um, but also um, which we've seen in Paul of Samosata. Now, the, just to make it clear, right, the Church of the East, they saw Paul of Samosata as a heretic, so they didn't agree with his Christology. But you can definitely see how they are related, um, even though they were uh, eventually um, bitter enemies, if you will. Um, continuing, and they say that God is in the uh, in this man just as a temple. From this, they say that the mystery of the incarnation was achieved through the honor which this man had obtained, and through his will. So that's exactly what I just said. So by not by his nature, but by his acts, by being, by living a life that's pleasing to God, by proving himself to God. Um, that's um, how he achieved the honor of becoming the Messiah. As a result, many of them say that in Christ there is but one will, even though they concede that Christ is true God and true man, and confess this Christ that Christ was born of the Virgin. Um, so that's sort of the nice that's the Nicene Creed, um, and also the Chalcedonian Creed. So the Church of the East adopted the Creed of Chalcedon. So they were formally Trinitarian, but underneath this um, sorry, underneath this Trinitarian veneer. Um, there's still there's still remnants which we can see from this um, anti-trinitarian past sort of um, which they've they've rejected since but it, it's still very obviously there. Um, so. So they be, um, even though they concede that Christ is true God and true man and confess that Christ was born of the Virgin, they are nevertheless unwilling to confess that God was born of the Virgin or that the Virgin was the mother of God. They believe that she was the mother of a man only. From this they say that it is not the same being which was born of God the Father from all eternity and born from the Virgin, his mother in time. Yeah. So this basically what, what this means is that the person that Mary... Um, give birth to was not the Logos. Right? The Logos is this um, eternal co-equal being to God, um, which in well, in typically in Trinitarian um, Christianity is believed um, to be Jesus Christ, or rather the other word, Jesus Christ is the incarnate Logos. Um, but here Ricardo says that the Nestorians do, do not believe that. Um, well, they do believe it, but they don't believe that Mary gave birth to this Jesus Christ, but that she only gave birth to Jesus without the Christ part, and that the Christ part came from God, sort of, and not uh, was not born of a woman. Um, again, we see the parallels to these Syrian pre-Nicene Christians, who would have believed something very similar, only for them, the Logos would not be co-equal to God. Um, the Logos would be a quality of God, a, a force emanating from God, which would then live in Jesus as a temple. They would have used the same the same phrasing as the historians here. Um, and also only because of Jesus' works and his the way he lived his life uh, and, that way, and that he proved himself. So very very similar to what the Nestorians believed um, basically the only difference is the nature of the logos um, is the logos a quality of god a force emanating from god or is it um, eternal and co-equal to god that's where they that's where they differ um, and that's what led to the split between the anti these anti-trinitarians and the Nestorian church i'm going to show you here another slide which we've had before so in 410 a.d 
the Sassanid king um, convokes the Council of Ctesiphon, where the Church of the East is sort of founded. Um, there were already, by the time, there were many bishops in Persia, many um, communities, many congregations. They were all sort of um, loosely, only loosely organized, if at all. Um, they were all independent of one another, and that was not a situation that um, Yasegurt I liked very much, so he wanted a one organization, more or less, and he um, included all of them. And um, when they did this, obviously they had to agree on a Christology, um, just like what happened in the Roman Empire with the Council of Nicaea. And they sort of agreed upon the um, Christology of Theodore and of Nestorius, which was formerly Trinitarian, um, but which was still based on this on this Syrian belief of proving oneself um, and of um, Jesus um, or like being born as a man. <clears throat> and that's really the point where these anti-Trinitarians said, no, we can't we can't go this step and they split off and eventually became um, proto the proto-Muslims and then later the Muslims. Um, and we can also we can really see this also here in um, Ricordo's text. He writes, and uh, and lest they be forced to say that he is divided into two sons, they say that he is one uh, skiax, which means one person in Arabic. So basically, that's um, Ricardo accused them that they believe of, um, that there are two sons, right? If they if they say that the, that Logos is different from Jesus, the the person that Mary has born, then they say, well, no, there's only one Skiax, which means person in Arabic, unless they be forced to say that God is born of a virgin. So if there's only one, right, then Mary must have been the mother of God. That's his argument. Um, unless they be forced to say that God is born of a virgin, they divide him into two aknum, which means two substances in Chaldean, Chaldean being Syriac Aramaic. From this they say that Christ has one skiax and two aknum, which, following a story, who was Greek, is expressed as one person and two substances. These Eastern historians are all Chaldeans and they read and pray in Chaldean. So they are Syrians, basically. They read and, they read and preach Syriac. Um, thus, they do not know the difference between Aknum and Skiax, and therefore it is very useful to ask them what the, de what the definition of Aknum and Skiax is, and what the difference between the two is. And in truth, there is no great difference, except that Skiax is the Arabic word for person and Aknum is the Chaldean word for person. As a result, as a result, when they speak in Arabic, they say that Christ is one person, and when they speak in Chaldean, they say that Christ is two persons. <clears throat> so here, um, we call to actually makes a linguistic argument, which is, I think, quite interesting. It's so something we don't see that often back then. Um, uh, I can't, I can't judge the argument. I don't know, but yeah, um, certainly an interesting, uh, interesting fact that he's doing it. And they say that Jesus Christ was a prophet and servant of God, according to Matthew and Isaiah. Behold, this is my chosen son. And thus, their position with regard to Christ, if examined closely, completely nullifies the mystery of the Incarnation. And therefore, and therefore, what they believe about Christ is nearly the same as the Saracens, who say that Christ is the Word of God and that he was born of the Virgin and of the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's in Surah 4, 171. And this is exactly what I said before. So there is really not much of a difference between the Nestorian um, beliefs or Christology and these anti-Trinitarian beliefs, um, which were later translated obviously into Islam. So that's why that's why Ricardo sees this connection there. I mean. Obviously, the one little difference that there is isn't little at all, right? It, the question is like, what is the nature of the logos is really um, a big question. But still, taking that out of the, the equation and, um, well, they are virtually interchangeable. Um, not only, not only in, in the beliefs, 
but also in the way they phrase it. Um, as we've just said here, right? the Saracens say that Christ is the Word of God, that's the Logos, and that he was born of the Virgin uh, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, it sounds, sounds very similar to what uh, modern-day Trinitarian Christians believe. The only difference is that Logos means something different for Muslims and before the Muslims, these anti-Trinitarians um, from whom they, they evolved, than it does for a Trinitarian Christian. Um, and of course now compared to uh, let's say the Western Catholic or also the Eastern Orthodox Church um, another, another difference is of course um, the reliance on, uh, on proving oneself um, that, or the focus on proving oneself in, in the theology that's very prevalent in um, Syria and then in also in the Syrian Syrian speaking church, Syriac speaking church in Persia, um, which is mirrored in Islam, of course, as well. <clears throat> okay, so now he's talking about again, um, debating with the historians and he claims again that he converts many of them. Um, and like with the Jacobites, there is no evidence that this had a lasting effect. So um, he probably did convert to them because um, in other, as we've seen in other places, um, when, when he doesn't speak about conversions, so presumably when he does speak about conversions, they were actually true, um, but probably only confined to individuals so that there wasn't uh, much of a lasting, lasting effect there. So the ultimate goal, the mission he was sent on was therefore a failure because it didn't manage um, to bring these Eastern churches back into the Catholic fold, even though he managed to convert some uh, of them. Um, but then he moves on to the Muslims, and this is also uh, really interesting. Since we desire to nullify the perfidy of Mahomet, we intend to confront them in their capital and in the place of their Studium Generale. It was necessary for us to converse with them a good deal, and they received us as angels of God in their schools and studia, in their monasteries and churches or synagogues, and in their homes. And we applied ourselves diligently to the study of their law, the Quran, and works, and we were stupefied to discover how, with a law of such perfidy, works of great perfection could be found. Um, here we have another, another picture. So this is now how our artist imagined uh, the, uh, the meeting between the Dominican monks and the Saracens would look like. Again, we can see the dunce's cap on the Saracen. And now, um, at first, Ricardo, he praises uh, the Muslims here. That's what he say here, the Saracen works of perfection. Um, he says, to say a great deal in, in only a few words, it must be known that the Saracens come to Baghdad to study from diverse provinces. There are many places in Baghdad which are devoted solely and com uh, to, which are de devoted solely to study and contemplation in the manner of our great monasteries. So here he's um, probably talking about the madrasas in, in Baghdad. So this, this uh, search for knowledge is something that he admires. And he goes on on prayer. What can I say about their prayer? For such is their solicitude and um, in and devotion to prayer that I was stupefied when through experience I saw it and witnessed it. For I traveled three months and a half without interruption with Saracen camel drivers in the deserts of Arabia and Persia, and there was never any hardship or crisis, crisis which prevented the Arab camel drivers from praying at fixed hours day and night, especially in the morning and evening." So again, something he admires in them. On almsgiving, as for to mercy for the poor, you must know that the Saracens are the most charitable. They have in the Quran a strict command to tithe. If they acquire this through force, they must give one fifth. And something I found interesting also, they even make wills to care for dogs in cities where there are many dogs, such as in Turkey, Persia, and also in Baghdad. We discovered that these dogs have agents who seek out wills left for dogs. So. 
that is an interesting fact uh, to note because that's not my experience at all in modern day Muslim countries. So today I wouldn't want to be a dog in a Muslim country. Um, apparently back then the situation was quite different. On their reverences for the name of God, they have the greatest reverence for the name of God and for prophets, saints and holy places. They take the greatest care in never doing, saying or writing anything of importance without first beginning with the name of God. On their dignified behavior, their behavior is so dignified that you would never see a Saracen there approach with his head held high or his eyes raised, or with a stiff neck, puffed up breast or outstretched arms. Rather, their gait, even that of small boys, is mature as if they were perfect monks of strict morals. On their friendliness, friendliness to foreigners. Their friendliness and urbanity towards foreigners is such that we were received as angels. When we wished to enter the homes of the noble and, le and the learned, for they received us with such gladness that it often seemed to us that we had truly found hosts of our own order. Hosts who welcomed us as free, hosts who welcomed us as freely as brothers into their own homes. Frequently, out of a certain urbanity and intimacy, they asked us to say something in praise of God or Christ. And whenever they said the name of Christ in our presence, they never did so without adding the appropriate acclamation. For example, Christ be praised, or something like that. On their concord and mutual love, they foster such concord and mutual love that they truly seem to be brothers. For when speak to each other, especially to foreigners, one will say to the other, O son of my mother. What's more, they will neither kill nor rob one another, rather a Saracen travels very securely among foreign and barbarian Saracens. Um, in this case, he is probably overstating the case, but maybe compared to contemporary Europe, um, or to his contemporary Europe, this, there is some truth to it. Um, hard to tell. But now after all the praise um, comes the critique. And he has a lot, of, uh, a lot to critique. So on the law of the Saracens. From now on we will speak briefly about the law of the Saracens. In sum, the law of the Saracens is lax, confused, obscure, exceedingly mendacious, irrational and violent. So their law is lax. Firstly, their law is lax by going against the rule of the philosophers of the world who say that it is as difficult to live virtuously as it is to hit the bull's eye of a target with an arrow. It is also against the rule of the highest and best philosopher, namely Christ, who says, narrow is the road which leads to life. For they believe that nothing is necessary for salvation except to say there is no God but God and, Muhammad, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. For the Saracens commonly believe that if a Saracen says this phrase, uh, alone he will be saved and even if he should commit all the sins in the world many other things are permitted and commanded in their law that is the quran but in the next life there is no punishment for transgressions it must be noted that when they are asked what praise muhammad has placed in the quran i believe more than 100 times they answer there is no god but god, but god. without a doubt there is no sect which contradicts this truth but this proposition is likewise true about everything. There is no dog but dog, there is no horse but horse, and so on. But the Saracens wish to say that just as it is obviously true that there is no God but God, so it is also true that Muhammad is the messenger of God. But how greatly do they injure the truth of philosophy by juxtaposing the most true of propositions with the most false? And how greatly do they injure God by juxtaposing the truth of God with the falsity and wickedness of Mahomet, which any sensible man can see for himself. And they believe that by saying this phrase alone, they will be saved. So clearly, um, Ricardo, not a big fan of uh, Muhammad or Mahomet. <clears throat> and he goes on, their law is confused. Also, their law is so confused that no one in the world can ascertain a clear order in it, for it does not follow the order of time or place as to the other prophets who prophesied at such a time, under such a king or in such a place. 
nor is the order of topics similar to that of other books. For it is so confused that no one can determine a clear reason why one chapter proceeds or follows another. As a result, the same story is sometimes placed in ten or more different locations. It is therefore thoroughly confused without a, a clear order or, of chapters. It is also confused in its explanation, for truly one does not know what it prohibits. It simultaneously prohibits and allows the same thing. Don't do such and such with which is prohibited by God, but if you do it, God is merciful and compassionate and knows that you are weak. Their law is obscure. Their law is also obscure in its interpretation, for among all Saracens it is st stated with great certainty and approval that there is no one who knows how to interpret the, the Quran except God alone. But how is it rational for God to give humans a law and want them to observe it, but not understand it? Moreover, how can they observe what they cannot understand? Therefore, the most perfect uh, among the Saracens go to brothels and say to a prostitute, I desire you, but fornication is not allowed. Sell yourself to me, and she sells herself to him, and after, praying the, and after paying the price, he says to her, You are truly mine. She, she allows this, and he concludes, According to our law, it is licit for me to do with you what I wish. And then he sleeps with her without fear, and it seems that Muhammad wishes the same thing in the Quran, which clearly and indecently states, Copulate with your wives, there is no sin in this, for you have paid the price you promised. Um, he goes on um, bringing up some other examples uh, for how they get around uh, the law. <clears throat> but now let's get to the next point. Their law is exceedingly mendacious. Their law is also exceed exceedingly mendacious, for besides the Quran, the Saracens have another book which Muhammad gave them, in which there are such lies and such incredible things that to speak about them would be too tedious and too unbelievable. So he is talking about the Hadith, obviously. And when the Saracens were astonished and asked Muhammad if these things were true, he responded that there are 12,000 words in this book which do not contain a truth, but that everything else is true. Consequently, when someone discovers a false statement there and complains about it, uh, and complains to them about it, they respond that this is one of the 12,000 lies, just as Muhammad himself said, but that all the rest remains true and authoritative. Uh, which Ricardo doesn't li um, really think makes a lot of sense. Can this book of yours be the only authentic and truthful one if it contains 12,000 lies according to the testimony of its own author? Indeed, the great Dr. Augustine said that if a person should find just one lie in the Gospel, all the rest would be considered a lie as well. But in speaking about the Quran, they are not content to say that it is the book of Muhammad, but that it is truly the word of God. But how is it he not ashamed, this God, who has uttered a Quran which states so many obvious lies? For it is written in many places uh, there that Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, was the sister of Aaron and Moses. But is it? But it is well known that the Virgin Mary gave birth to Christ during the time of Caesar Augustus, who ruled Rome and was the monarch at, uh, at the time. But Miriam, the daughter of Amram and the sister of Moses and Aaron, died in the desert before the Jews entered the Promised Land. Likewise, the same Muhammad says in the chapter El Kamal, which means moon, that the moon had split apart in its own time, and that half fell on a mountain, which is called Red, and the other half fell on another mountain in another part of the city. But how could the moon have split apart? And if it had split apart, how could it have had the nature of heavy bodies which fall? And if it had fallen, how did it not occupy a considerable part of the earth? Wouldn't the sea and all the swamps have been combined? How could such a miracle have escaped the notice of the entire world? Nor do the Saracens use hyperbole or simile, neither do they interpret this book spiritually as we do certain passages in the book of Revelation. Rather, all their interpretations are literal. They say that the moon really did split apart. Muhammad asked God to do it in order to reassure his disciples who had demanded a sign from him. Their law is irrational. 
The doctrine of the Quran is also irrational. Who could ever provide a rational explanation for what has been written there about divorcing one's spouse? For it is written there that as many times as a man can divorce his wife, he can reconcile with her. But if he wishes to reconcile with her after the third divorce, another man must first take her for wife and have sexual relations with her. Um, and he goes on uh, in more detail um, how shameful all of this is. But what seems to be the most irrational and possible is that, it, that in many places in the Quran it is written that if a demon became the devil it is because he did not wish to follow God's command to worship Adam. For it is written there that God commanded the angels to worship Adam and in Arabic this is written with a word which can be understood to mean the kind of adoration required by Latria, namely Abdu Saiju. But how can God forget his own precepts which he, had, uh, which he has repeated so often, saying, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. But about virtue and the perfection of the intellect, Muhammad said absolutely nothing. And when their sages began to curse the per perversity of the law openly, and when the law could be refuted by the books of the prophets, the book of Moses, and the truthful books of the philosophers, the Caliph of Baghdad commanded that nothing could be studied in Baghdad except the Quran. As a result, we found them to know very little about either the truth of theology or the subtlety of philosophy. Nevertheless, their sages put no faith in the sayings of the Quran. If in secret, they dis in secret they deride it, but in public they honor it for fear of the others. Um, hard to tell if this is true, um, but that's how uh, Ricardo uh, perceived it. Um, apparently, back then, uh, a lot of people, out of fear of the others, refused to speak out against Islam. They say that we have falsified the gospel and that the Jews have falsified the prophets and the law of Moses, since neither in the law or the prophets or the gospel can one find written what is said in the Quran. But this book holds exactly the opposite, for his, writings, for his writing goes against everyone and the writings of everyone else go against him. For in the Quran, Muhammad praises the Pentateuch and the prophets and especially the Psalms. Truly he praises Christ and the Gospel above all, and declares that Christ says in the Gospel, I announce to you that I will send an ambassador of God after me, and his name is Mahomet. But because this is not written in our Gospel, they do not accept the Gospel and say that we have corrupted it. But how could, Christian, but how could Christians and Jews, who have such a great and ancient hatred for each other, have agreed to falsify the Pentateuch, prophets and Gospels, all of which had already been written and published in every language throughout the entire world? How could the Latins and Greeks have agreed with the Chaldeans, who are Nestorians and Jacobites, who had separated from them through schism and excommunication before the time of Muhammad, and who are such adversaries? How could they have agreed to change the Gospel? Without doubt, the Nestorians have been a complete adversaries of the Jacobites since before the time of Muhammad, and both the Jacobites and the Nestorians have been cut off from the Latins and the, Greek, and the Greeks since before the time of Muhammad. Despite this, we have discovered among them, um, in both Chaldean and Arabic, the same translation and truth in the Gospel as that which is found among the Greeks and the Latins. Furthermore, why did Christians remove from the Gospel the name of Muhammad, he who, he, so, he who so praised Christ and the Gospel, when they allowed to be written there in full the names of Herod the, who persecuted him, Pilate, Annas and Caiaphas who crucified him, Judas who betrayed him, Peter who denied him, and so on? Moreover, such an alteration and corruption of the Gospel was either hidden and then it could not have been generally known that the truth of the Gospel remained in a few places, or it was generally known and manifest and then it could not have been hidden. Moreover, if the Saracens know that the Gospel has been corrupted and altered among the, all the Christians in the whole world, then they should show us an intact Gospel in their possession. For in Baghdad and in Mecca there have been since ancient times centers of study whose archives preserve the oldest books of the Saracens. 
which they showed to us, and yet there was never they, and yet they were never able to show us another gospel except for the one we have. Likewise, what the Saracens say about the gospel and the prophets that they have been corrupted by the Christians and Jews is expressly against their own law. For Muhammad says in the Saracens for Muhammad says to the Saracens in the Quran, if any doubt should arise among you, ask those who received the books before you, namely the Christians and Jews. And afterwards he adds that God said to him, We have preserved the truth among them, and we will continue to preserve it. All this is introduced in the Quran from the mouth of God, they say. Therefore Muhammad sent them to the two corrupt copies, and they made a liar out of God himself, since he did not preserve his own truth in the books of Jews and Christians, as he said. Now, sixth and last, it must be known that the law of the Saracens is violent. Their law was introduced through violence. As a result, they are most certain that their law will endure only as long as they have victory by the sword. They falsely attribute to their prophet many great miracles, all of which is contrary to the Quran, which states that God said to Muhammad, I will not permit you to perform miracles, because I know that they will not believe in you. But I will give you the sword, and so that through violence you will compel them to believe. But how would they not have believed him? How, but how would they not have believed in him if he had performed miracles? They who believe in him and accept a law of such perfidity without a miracle. Moreover, he described two signs or arguments which he and the Saracens judge entirely sufficient to prove that the Quran is the work of God and not a person. One is that he says that such a book could not have been made either by angels or by demons. The other is that he himself says that if the Quran were not from God, there would be contradictions in it. But indeed, there are many contradictions in it, and it contradicts itself, for in many places it prohibits Saracens from quarreling or exchanging harsh words with men from another sect. But they must abandon themselves freely to God, who gives, who guides whomever he wishes and causes to err, err whomever, whomever he wishes. And so those who err do not have to answer to God, because God himself causes them either to err or to advance. He teaches in many places in the Quran, both at the beginning and the end. Kill those who do not believe until they believe, and so on. I concede the first argument, namely that in no way could angels have either known how to or wished to make a book filled with so many lies, blasphemies and obscenities. But in truth the demons knew, very, knew well how to do so. I believe, therefore, that with great effort and attentiveness they composed such, a cr such crimes and sins. For it is also written in the Quran that the Quran pleases demons, and that when they heard Elgin, which means little demons, they were filled with great admiration and commended the book, and many demons became Saracens. People can therefore defeat the Saracens and easily refute them through the Holy Book, the authority of Holy, uh, Holy Scripture, the books of the philosophers, and the path of reason. But the easiest way of all is through the Quran itself, which clearly manifests in its own abominable falsity to all who read it. Yep. And that is where we're gonna stop. Um, now, Ricardo goes on a little bit about Baghdad and about um, yeah, well, what he sees there, but his story actually ends in Baghdad itself. Um, so he finished his work sometime around um, 1290 AD, 1291 AD, and he stayed in Baghdad for another while before he uh, returned to Europe. Let's, let me open the map again real quick. Um, here we are. So around tw um, 1292 he returns to Europe. He actually brings with him a copy of the Quran, which I think is still in the Vatican Library um, get, um, with his notes in the margins. And he wrote another, a more detailed book against the Quran, um, trying to disprove it and basically prove it as a fraud, which later became quite influential, particularly in Germany, 
because Martin Luther translated it into German and it was one of the one of the early uh, books that were printed and mass distributed. And he did so um, shortly after the siege of Vienna, when the Ottoman Turks besieged Vienna for the first time, uh, which was here, yeah, here, this is Vienna. So that's how far the Ottomans got. And it really, um, it, it shook Europe and particularly the Germans, of course. And then Martin Luther translates this book against the Quran by um, Ricoldo da Monte di Croce. And that's what then that became then sort of how at least Germans saw the Turks um, and uh, became became an important book. Anyway, um, so much uh, for today. I hope you like this new format. Um, let me know in the comments what you think about it. If this is something maybe we should do more often. I'm going a bit, I wouldn't say off topic, but um, maybe deviating a little bit and going into different places. What do you think about it? What would you think about going even more off topic? Um, I don't know. Uh, let, let me know. And if you like what you see, you can, of course, uh, support me. It would uh, help out a great deal. Um, I'll put the links uh, somewhere below. And um, yeah, if, if you like my content, I would definitely appreciate it. I appreciate everybody who is already supporting. Um, it's always amazing to, um, to see that, that there are people who think that my <laughs> work is valuable enough. Um, thank you very much. And with that, um, yeah, thanks everyone for watching and see you next time.